All right, I'm working here on uh, Dead of Winter. I just finished um, the action phase of, or the activation segment of the second turn. Um, I think I actually have to replace some leaders that got killed on the second turn. Um, Polk, that's the brigade commander Polk, not the core commander Polk. Um, he was killed last turn, I believe. His brigade is here. And then, although on the placement, I don't know if they go where they were killed. Leader placement phase, flip the fallen counter over to the placement leader side and place the new leader with any unit in that command. All right. I think I'll keep him where he was. I already had the fatigue marker there. Um, on the union side, the union lost uh, brigade commander post. And more on him in a minute. His brigade essentially disintegrated. I mean, I think he's only got one regiment left on the field, which is the 22nd Indiana right here. Um, I think that's it for the eliminated leaders. Um, so far, you can see after two turns, uh, the Confederates have lost some Cav. More on that in a minute. And uh, elim one eliminated regiment, that was the sharpshooter, uh, the Mississippi sharpshooters. They were only two strength. So um, then a couple of routed units in Claiborne's um, division. You can see a lot worse here for the Union in the, with uh, Davis and uh, Johnson's divisions getting pretty hard hit with routes. Uh, and then they've lost lots of guns um, as these units have routed away. So uh, about what you'd expect given the nature of this battle. So what we're looking at here is the right wing of the Union position. And that's the whole Union line all the way over to there. Um, and then this is the right side of the Confederate position here on the uh, north bank of the Stones River. Um, that's Breckenridge's division there, and you've got, um, what is this, uh, Withers and Cheatham's divisions, which are intermixed, and so they have a, a, uh, command structure in place where essentially Cheatham is commanding two of Withers' brigades and vice versa, um, in order to coordinate this attack, their, their commands ended up crossed, that's a rule you can allow, um, them to control or to command these two other brigades of each divisions, of each other divisions, um, and you can end that at any point you wish. Um, so right now I'm sticking with it because the attack is underway and they are intermixed. So um, over here, so far, and you can see here there's a couple of collapsed Confederate regiments. So this is the big surprise attack on the Union right um, that historically happened. Um, I'm playing with the various optional rules that allow that allowed for that, that basically helped the game achieve that historic result of this surprise attack on the Union right flank, uh, which there's rules that prevent the Union regiment or the, any Union units from firing on any Confederate units until they're either fired upon or attacked. Um, so even if uh, Confederate units are within um, sight, I believe, let me double check that, of, let's see, yeah, Johnson, Davis, and Sheridan's activation markers, so Johnson, Davis, and Sheridan are basically um, your division commanders of these, of McCook's uh, three divisions, um, and there's Davis. Johnson, I think, is back actually back here with McCook. Um, 
which actually he would be moved up so that he could be within range of his brigade commanders. Um, I meant to move him. I think I just moved him back there. I meant to move him up. Um, so Johnson, Davis, and Sher Sheridan is uh, back here, um, closer to the center of the Union position. Uh, those guys couldn't do anything. Um, they were their and their activation markers weren't even placed in the, the uh, chip pull cup um, until they've either been fired on or a rebel unit has moved adjacent. So that allows the rebel units to move around the flank here, um, pretty close to the Union position where ordinarily they might be drawing fire. Uh, in this case, they weren't allowed to because the because of the rules, um, which allows them to get an attack uh, not unlike what happened historically, where uh, these two Union divisions, um, Johnson and Davis, their units were essentially completely destroyed uh, and just, just disintegrated um, under the, the Confederate attack. As you can see here, uh, that's not what has happened um, in this battle. We have a still fairly um, substantial Union second line here uh, in Johnson's division, and Davis's division is the one that's actually um, having the most problems right now. Uh, one of the big issues for the Confederates is simply that they're, they don't have enough guys um, to sustain the sort of shock combat that is what essentially historically destroyed the Union right. Uh, I mean, the only way I can figure it of what happened historically in game terms is that uh, all of these uh, div uh, brigades essentially suffered route chain reactions um, that just caused the whole thing to melt away. And that's what I had a little bit of it um, this last turn. You can see this big gap here uh, in the Union lines. This is where Post's brigade was. And you can see he was the guy that was killed. Um, he has one regiment left in his brigade. The rest of them have routed, and that was all route chain reaction from shock combat. So, uh, so it's happened a little bit, um, not to the level it did historically, where basically two whole divisions route chain reacted right out. Um, you know, in the first hour of fighting, we're already two hours in, and you can see there's still somewhat of a uh, of a Union defense here on the right. Um, another thing that's happened here, as you can see. There's Cav fighting over here, and the Union, this is Zom's, uh, some of these Ohio Cavalry regiments uh, were able to get around on the flank of the Confederate Cav, and they charged through and had a lot of shot continuation, uh, Cav charge continuation through. So you can see there's some disordered units. These guys here had to retreat. Um, largely, I mean, I think part of the success is, and you can see these guys are blown now because they've... <laughs> charged through, took some, took some uh, hits, but these are pretty large um, cavalry regiments. They're seven strength as compared to uh, a lot of these, the Confederate ones that they hit were all these two strength ones. Um, so that's going to be not only were they getting hit in the flank, but then there was a, you know, a, a, a size modifier. So there's a couple of big Confederate regiments here though, that should be able to mount a pretty substantial counterattack and, uh, uh, in fact, two of the Union, these two Union regiments here, uh, weren't even able to charge. They failed their uh, their charge roll, their cavalry charge roll, which means if you fail it, it's it's a basically a UDD roll um, uh, against their morale, and uh, you can see their morale is pretty low. Um, not the not the greatest quality uh, units, but you know it's 1862. That's about the best you can expect of Union cavalry. Um, but in terms of cavalry charges, which I'd never actually done one of these games before, as many many years as I've been playing the Great Battles of the American Civil War system, um, I've never actually done a cavalry against cavalry charge before. So uh, that was kind of a learning experience, and it was pretty cool to see um, the effect of the Union troops uh, cutting through the Confederates in, in a game like this, where the beginning is intended, you know, if, you're, if it goes at all historically, and it's kind of set up to do that, uh, you're, you end up with Union troops that are going to get 
just completely overrun. Um, so this was a little bright spot for the Union there on the first turn was they were able to inflict a little damage on the Confederate cavalry there um, and uh, potentially add a little support to the beleaguered Union right. Um, but I think uh, just given, you know, these guys, you can see here, this is McCown's br uh, brigade. These guys are all a little bit disordered, um, but they're sort of reforming. I'm getting the artillery brought around. If I can get the artillery out into this open field here, then uh, that's going to be bad news for these guys who don't really have any artillery left. Uh, most of their stuff was overrun uh, in the initial Confederate charge. And uh, um, th there are rules for abandoned guns. Um, I have not played the, this is the latest uh, 2019 edition of the rule book. This is the rule book that issued with um, uh, the Death Valley up there, which is uh, sitting up there on the shelf ready. Um, I've got it punched and clipped, um, but had this already set up at the time that I received Death Valley. Um, but I do look forward to getting into some of those Shenandoah battles um, once I'm done with this monster. Uh, but the, the rule book that shipped with Death Valley was this latest version, the 2019 edition. Um, I had printed it out off of the GMT website and stuck it in a, uh, in a, uh, a binder. So I'd have a nice printed version of it. Um, it has rules in it for abandoned guns, which I did not, have not played before in this series of uh, the last version of the rules that I played. Um... It actually probably was these, because I have not played Twin Peaks either. So um, I think I was using the 2009 edition. This was the rulebook that shipped with um, Dead of Winter when it came out. And uh, man, 2009 was 10 years ago. Um, so I had not played with abandoned guns before. I didn't really feel like learning the new system. So I'm just doing any case where guns are abandoned, they're just eliminated. That's basically how it was in the old system. So... That's what's happened here. Uh, lots of Union artillery was eliminated um, when their uh, regiments either routed or had to retreat uh, out from under them in shock combat. So um, the Union position here, this is hanging very tentatively on a green uh, Illinois regiment right here. This is Willick's Brigade. Um, and I think there's only two, yeah, there's only these two regiments left of Willick's Brigade. And then <clears throat> Kirk looks like he's got three regiments left here still, and a, and a pretty big one. The, these guys are going to be tough to to get out of the cedars here. Um, and I think what's what's ultimately going to to displace them will simply be that they're going to get flanked. Um, they'll have guys coming in behind them, and they'll be kind of exposed. You can see they've already got um, some of Claiborne's troops coming in around that are going to end up cutting them off. So. They may just have to pull out of that position. Um, but the cedars are a very tough uh, place to fight in. And you can see those are the cedars are this darker green um, as, a, as compared to the lighter, the lighter green regular woods. Um, the cedars have an extra minus modifier. Uh, woods are minus one for, for uh, fire and shot combat. Cedars are minus two for fire and shot combat. So they're a very good position to make your defensive stand in as what happened historically I mean, you can see up here in the map, the slaughter pen, that's all cedar, cedar forest around there. Uh, you can see that it's taken forever for the Confederates to move through there. Uh, artillery can't move through it at all without becoming automatically disordered. So it's a tough, uh, it's a tough beat uh, to try and launch an attack through. And historically, the Union, uh, the Union position just disintegrated all the way back to here. And Sheridan kind of pitched his last stand here at the slaughter pen and, uh, the Union line was basically um, running there along the river up to here, the Round Forest, and then back out this way. Um, it had just basically folded back on itself in sort of a V-shaped uh, position as the Confederates just swept around this entire side of the battlefield. Um, I don't know if I'm going to get anywhere close to that. This attack, um, there's some promise uh, here if the if the, the Claiborne can have some success here and possibly dislodge these guys again that can kind of get around in a flank. But this is Sheridan's got a pretty, you know, his, he's untouched at this point. 
these guys are not having a lot of success um, approaching this line. I'm kind of stuck in fire combat here. I can try and get up and do shot combat, but I don't want to get too far ahead with these guys before these guys can actually get up and support them. And right now they're just stuck hacking their way through these woods. Um, so, you know, I may have... I may have even wanted to wait before I did anything with these guys as opposed to just getting into a long, drawn-out fire combat um, just for these guys to get closer so I could do a more coordinated attack. But I felt like if I didn't put any pressure here, um, it was going to leave the Union too free a hand to you know move any extra guys around to try and reinforce um, the right where I'm trying to collapse it you know, as per the historical results. So... Uh, this is hinging on, you know, there's a good second line defense here, um, of some pretty beefy Union regiments. Um, if I can get some route throughs maybe, or get the cav to break around and get out on the flank, something to try and dislodge these guys, um, just so that, that Claiborne and McCown's troops aren't just completely gassed by the time they get up there. Um, but this is my big exploration, uh, this is Liddell's um, brigade here, and these guys are going to try and exploit the gap. Um, it's tempting to want to go this way and try and get around on the main Union line, but they could also be just as useful coming in around behind and completely blowing up um, Baldwin's brigade here. That would essentially eliminate Johnson's division as a fighting force. Um, they would be pretty well collapsed. Uh, in fact, I think Willick here should have a collapsed marker. His brigade is collapsed uh, because they've lost more than half of their units. So uh, that's already going to affect them. I don't... It might have had an effect on... I'm trying to remember what the collapsed effects are on... Um, individual regiments, because that may have affected how these guys held out. They might not have held out as well as they did um, if there were some sort of collapsed effects that should have been applied to the whole brigade. Um, so, some decisions here on what to do with Liddell, but this entire brigade basically has a free hand with the disintegration of Post's, uh, Post's brigade from the attack by uh, Johnson's brigade. So, uh, Wood has had some problems. I think he's the guy. Yeah, Woods had two regiments routed in his attack here on um, Carlin's brigade. He's got them in disorder, but he's also pretty well disordered. And then uh, Polk here was just killed in his assault, and so these guys are not having the greatest um, attack up here. And part of it is because there was Union artillery here which I've since now overrun, so that should also make things a little bit easier, but the artillery just takes, when you're charging guns, uh, you know, unless you're getting around on the flank, if you're doing a frontal charge on guns, it's not not pretty, so with that Union artillery gone, it may be a little easier now, but I may I may end up recruiting Liddell to, to lend some help to Wood here, who's definitely running out of gas. Um, I think McCown, his entire division, you know, on one basically left, um, with just one brigade left in front of it, should be able to do that on their own. Um, and this can get Liddell started on trying to turn this flank here and uh, eliminate Davis's division. Um, if in the next turn I can effectively hobble Davis and Johnson's divisions uh, as fighting forces, um, I'll be pretty well in line with how things went historically, where Sheridan... Uh, who's again in this position right here. His guys were the um, the bulwark, uh, which which saved, bought the Union enough time um, to get their position underway. Um, as far as what's going on over here, there are also rules that state um, that and all left, the first eight activations of any left wing units has to be crossing at this ford here over to this side of the river. At the time the battle historically launched, uh, Rosecrans's troops were under his attack orders, which were to hit the Confederate right. Um, what ended up happening was Bragg's troops attacked first. 
before the Union troops could start implementing Rosecrans's plan. Um, Crittenden's division, he was in command of the left wing of the Union Army. His guys were essentially starting to move into position when they were told, hey, uh, there's a big problem on the Union rights. We need you guys to abandon your attack and come back and help defend. Um, I, th I think I did this wrong uh, according to the rules, right? I moved everybody, and that included Hazen, who historically was here, the guy that was defending the round forest and holding the center of the Union line. Um, I ended up moving everybody out of there, and that just left this giant hole that immediately the Confederates started moving forward. I don't think, according to the rules, um, you, can, you don't have to actually move everybody. You can just spend those first eight activations on, like, one division. Um of the right wing and I think leave the other ones stationary. I ended up moving everybody, um, which is what, why I've ended up with troops like Hazen, who's like all the way over here now, historically out of position, or out of position from now, from where they were historically. Uh, what I ended up doing um, to your allocate for that was to move Russo's division here, which is part of Thomas's center wing, um, move them up to this round forest position and link up with the right wing. Um, this is Negley, he's also a part of uh, Thomas's center wing. Um, but I, I, I sort of shifted them down so that they could link up with Sheridan's right wing position and have a contiguous union line and not have any gaps there. Um, and Ru so Russo's guys, they start you know bunched up way back here. Historically, they were brought in to, again, bolster Sheridan's position, which had completely inverted back on itself across the slaughter pin here, and Rousseau was originally brought in to, to, to shore up the Union right. In this case, I'm using him literally as the Union center, and now uh, Hazen, who is part of Palmer's division. Um, these guys that were originally the Union center are probably going to be <laughs> doing what Rousseau did and coming around here to help the Union right. So, uh, and I'm still not sure how to handle Breckenridge. I think I've already started moving his uh, division forward to, to work around on the Union left. So I'm gonna have to have some kind of defense here. And you can see I've got some guys that are already establishing a line, but you know, two brigades, two Union brigades is not gonna be enough um, to defend. And I think at this point I've got three, I've got Price, Fife, and Beatty. Um, those are all part of Van Cleve's division. Also got the pioneers over here that I can use if I need to. Um, I don't know. They may not be enough to defend against Breckenridge's division, which you can see is huge. So, um, but, you know, I'm, I'm hesitant to move Palmer's entire division, and that's these guys here. I could, I guess, move... Um, These guys, Haskell, Harker, well, there it is, Wood. I could move Wood's division across the river. Um, that would give me two divisions to try and hold against Breckenridge over there. It may work. Um, I don't know. We'll have to see how these guys in the center do and then how much uh, reinforcement I'm going to need on the Union right here. I think there's there are more center Union reinforcements coming, I do believe. Here we go, but not for quite a few hours. And there's some Confederates that are going to be coming on before then. So we'll see. We'll see what uh, the, the train over here, it's sort of broken up. There's no cedars, so it's not going to be the slam dunk Union defense, uh, you know, that you might have over here in like the slaughter pen or whatever. Um, depends on what sort of position I can get set up here. Historically, I think the Union had kind of a line here. Um, Breckenridge didn't attack in force until the third day of the battle, you know, the second day of fighting. It was a three-day battle, but there was no fighting on January 1st. Um, so we'll see what, what, uh, what sort of defense I can patch together here um, just to keep... Breckenridge from getting down here and crossing the ford or threatening the Union rear. 
um, or historically what they were trying to do, which was break the Union supply line here on the um, Nashville and Chattanooga Railroad line and the Nashville Pike um, of the Union supply line back to Nashville. So we'll see. This is, again, early days. Um, this is the full battle, uh, the full four maps. Um, again, starting turn three out of whatever, 20 odd turns, a lot of turns. So we'll see. There's no way I'm going to finish. I never finish these, but, uh, I'd like to get the battle developed, um, into some, you know, several, several hours in at least get it developed into something. So you can kind of see what direction things might go or have a better idea of what direction things might go. Um, even though, you know, I'm not going to play it all the way to the literal end of the game. It would probably be decided well before then anyway. So that's a look at where I'm at in Dead of Winter. Maybe there'll be another video. Maybe there won't. You know how it is. 